you know what, I've, uh, I've, I've been doing this thing called letting go. I'm like, oh great, how have you been doing it? Whenever I don't feel too good, I breathe into it. I'm like, is that it? Yeah. That is just terrible. That is just scratching the surface. If that's you, oh my God. I also hear people where it's like, I've been trying to let go for like two, three years and not much has happened. Because you're doing it the wrong way. We think it's that simple. We dumb it down. That's how stupid we are. I guess letting go is just breathing in. No, no, no. Letting go isn't just breathing. It's not just sitting at home and breathing into how you're feeling. There is so much more to that. It's also not just meditating. There's a lot of action involved, and people will use it as an excuse to avoid taking action. No joke, the more this idea spreads, which is a beautiful idea, even the technique, it's an amazing technique. This whole philosophy, even going deeper in terms of spirituality, is something that can change your lives and be so uplifting. But people use it in such a terrible way where it hurts them more than they help. It's terrible, okay? So number one, when it comes to letting go, sure, you can breathe into what you're feeling, but if all you're doing is processing what's happening in the present moment, you're forever gonna stagnate. Think of it like this. Every single one of you, all of us, we have this huge reservoir of things we've been disowning, things we've been just stuffing down from the moment you're born. None of us are immune to it, we all have it. We have a reservoir of fear, a reservoir of grief, a reservoir of anger. Why do you think it is that you snap when someone cuts you off in traffic? Anyone ever snap and start yelling in the car? Raise your hand. Own it. I have. Anyone? Like you just start like, like just really just pissed. Yeah. Realistically, should something like that piss you off that much? No. What happened? There was simply a lot of anger beneath the surface and that thing was that little drop that made that reservoir overflow. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. That's it. Now what do people do? They only focus on that, in the moment. Oh, I'm yelling in the car. I heard I should let go. Let me breathe into it. Now what do they do? They only focus on that little drop. The tank, the reservoir is still full. And then they go about their day and someone else cuts them off and they snap again. And they snap again, and they snap again, and they snap again, and all they do is focus on that little drop. That's better than nothing, but hey, you're gonna have to start addressing the reservoir. You're gonna have to dive into and process that entire tank. That's not just done through breathing. You're gonna have to get in touch with your subconscious, the things you disowned with your past. The same with, for example, surface level fears is an example. Right? I'm scared of putting myself out there. Ask yourself why. People just stop at the surface. I'm scared of public speaking. Why? Well, what if I say something stupid? Why? Why is that scary? Well, then people will laugh at me. Why is that scary? Then I'll get rejected. Why is that scary? Then I'll be alone. The deeper you go, you start tapping into what we call core fears. Process that and anything on the surface that's associated to that will fade away. The same with different present moment experiences. You get really triggered, hey, when was the previous time you experienced that? What about a time before that? When was the first time? Now it's fine here if you don't actually remember the first time. Very few people do, right? A lot of people could argue that the first time you even experienced trauma might have been when you were born. Anyone remember being born? Yes, no? No. Right? Someone's like, yes, I do. And I remember my past life. <laughs> no. Right? Even as a baby, by the way, the first few months, you don't even have a 3D perspective. You don't even know what this thing is. You can't even see this far ahead. You can't even form a memory. Doesn't mean you can't experience trauma, but you're not going to remember it as a typical memory. If you want to go even deeper, right? Like, there's a lot of studies that say that the way that we even store a traumatic memory is we'll purposely, unconsciously start splitting up like the visual side, right? The hearing side, all the senses, so we can't even put it together as a proper memory. So it's not about logically remembering like when exactly was the first time? Oh yeah, I got bumped on the way out. No, no, no. 
It's remaining in the state of openness and just seeing what comes up, going a lot deeper. The whole point is tackling that reservoir, not just the surface. Okay? This also involves a lot of action. For example, proactively triggering yourself, knowing that, hey, there's some reservoir, say, around fear. What are some things that I can do to proactively bring some of that up? We follow what I call the action, trigger, release, repeat formula. Action, you get triggered, you let go and you repeat the process. So there's a lot of action involved with letting go. And this is what a lot of people who just resonate with surface level spirituality don't get. They think that, oh, if I just read a book about letting go and I just, oh, I guess breathing's better than not breathing, nothing's gonna change. That's a huge mistake. Okay, that's mistake number one. They just focus on the surface. Mistake number two is they use it as an excuse to avoid taking action. Is it comfortable to take transformative action? Yes or no? Yeah, no. no. <laughs> Who said yes? No! <laughs> how did you say? Like, how dare you? No, it's not. That's why there are literally books, an entire book called The One Thing. Anyone read that book? It's an amazing book. But literally all that it says is, hey, do the one thing that will change your life the most. That's it. Out of everything you could do right now, if you think of your win, your goal, what's one thing that you could do that can move you the closest to that goal? Because what a lot of people do is they just kind of dabble or they focus on what we call productive procrastination where it seems like you're being productive, but in reality, you're procrastinating. A lot of people use self-help for that. They think that listening to a podcast or an audio book is them being productive. <laughs> and in reality, they're just procrastinating. Taking true transformative action, there's a lot of resistance towards that. It's very difficult. And this is why some people can find it very appealing. Well, I heard about this letting go thing, and um, does that mean I don't have to take all this action? Are you saying that I could just um, sit at home and meditate and things will change magically? Sign me up! And people get drawn to that. A lot of weak-willed people get drawn to spirituality for that reason. They're too scared to take action. But they know that they're not happy where they're at. And then you have classic self-help, like, do it! And they're like, no, that's too much. Meditate. It'll all be fine. Ooh, okay, I'll do that. And that's terrible. That is beyond terrible. And you'll see people go after meditation, after meditation, after meditation. They're like, I spent my entire day meditating. Did anything change? Well, I, no, but I've spent a lot of time in my room breathing. Right? Audit how well you're doing, but how much your life is actually changing. Letting go does not mean not taking action. It actually means taking even more action. But you're letting go of a lot of that initial resistance which allows you to take more action. So if you catch yourself in that trap, trap one is what? Focusing on the surface. Trap two is not taking action, only releasing. Spending hours and hours and hours at home. That's terrible. Letting go should enhance your life. It should not become your life. And the third big one is people think that letting go is getting rid of. And this is where you hear those horror stories. It's been two, three years. I've been trying to let go. It's still there. Why is it still there? Because they misinterpreted the idea. Now that's how any normal person would interpret it, right? You hear letting go, right? If there's something that you don't like experiencing, what do you do? You get rid of it. That's how you let go of it, right? And then they'll do the meditations and they're like, breathe. And they're like, let me just get rid of it. Breathe it out. Breathe it out, baby. That's it. What happens if you do that? By trying to breathe it out, what are you labeling it as? Bad. If you label it as bad, what happens? You resist it. And whatever you resist persists. Letting go, in reality, is the act of not doing. By default, you're doing right now. By default, what are you doing? You're stuffing it down. 
You are resisting it. All that stuff, it wants to leave on its own. You don't have to make it leave. You just have to stop resisting. Meaning, letting go is actually letting go of the resistance. Letting go equals accepting, embracing, allowing yourself to experience it fully. I'm not trying to get rid of, not trying to fix. Also, not trying to mentally understand and make sense of. Experiencing it fully. Something that's very simple but very hard to do. Those three traps keep people stuck. And then they go down this rabbit hole of just years and years and years of like, I think I'm doing it right, and nothing's truly changing. Don't fall into that trap. That is terrible. That is no better than a self-help junkie, than a hustler. Right? I'm just always taking action. It's like, no better than that. Now, here's some other things that happen. Say you actually start doing it right. And this is a more advanced sticking point when it comes to letting go, is that people actually start processing things. They actually stop resisting it. They start dissolving that reservoir, right? You start letting some of that charge out. But then, instead of giving themselves the power, they give the letting go technique the power. This one's advanced, but very subtle. Meaning, I'm not the one doing it, the technique is. And they become attached to what? Letting go. Get it? They now need to let go. And you'll see them throughout the day, it's like something comes up, it's like, oh, I must let go, I must let go, I must let go. And it's like this compulsive relation with letting go. And they're just giving all the power to letting go, letting go, letting go, versus, no, you're the one doing that. Not the technique, you. And what's going to have to happen then? You're going to have to let go of letting go. Of letting go. Of letting go. Of letting go. For someone who's a bit more advanced, it's actually a great release to do. Letting go of the need to let go. What comes up then? Okay, if you've read, if you're at that point, by the way, do read the book, Jed McKenna, Spirituality, The Darnest Thing. It's a very nihilistic book. Be careful how you interpret it. But it's a very, you could say, punch to the face to a lot of the uh, classic spiritual ideas. A lot of the classic spiritual conditioning. Spirituality, I, I, I'm paraphrasing. I, the Darnest Thing. Jed McKenna, Spiritual Enlightenment. It's the first book he wrote. He has three, three, three main ones. The first one's really good. And uh, there's a series of uh, stories that he shares where he's talking to students. And again, this is a, a pseudonym. No one knows really who wrote it, from my understanding. And it's so funny how he just mocks these stereotypes. All right, like he's sitting down, he's like, and then my student Sarah came up to me and we spoke. And she's like, Jed, you know, Teach me about enlightenment. I want to be enlightened. And he's like, why? Well, because everyone wants to, right? Isn't that the goal? Yeah, but why do you want to? Well, I, um, I want to achieve non-duality. What is that? Why? Well, because then, um, you know, you're, you're, like, you're like happy. I want to be enlightened. And he just mocks all these stereotypes. Where, for example, a lot of people think that enlightenment, right? They're not really as he says, signed up for enlightenment, they think that enlightenment is like this heaven on earth. Right? It's like, when I let go completely and I'm enlightened, um, I will experience no fear and no bad emotions and I will be in this non-dual state of perfection at all times. No stress, nothing, just bliss 24-7. That's not normal, that's not real, that's not human. What is that? That's like the fantasy, that's the old school conditioning. Look at old school spiritual gurus wearing the robes and stuff. <coughs> no, but for real, that's why I actually wear it. It's kind of to mock this. Like old school spiritual gurus, they'll show up here on stage. I'd right? even take someone like Osho. Love a lot of his ideas, but the guy's like, right? Um, they'll show up here on stage and they're like, peasants, listen closely, right? And people buy this. They fall for it. It's insane, right? 
Even today, a lot of people still buy that. They'll see someone and they'll just put a little clip, a little video out where you see them in a good mood. And they're like, listen, you know, and they'll act very peaceful. They'll sit like this, like, peasants, I'm talking to you, yes, you are the peasants. When you process your emotions, like yours truly, when you become enlightened, like yours truly, you will experience no pain. You will experience no fear. You will experience no anger. You will transcend yourself and your emotions. And you will become godly. You will be in a state of bliss, a state of joy. You will climb the ladder and you will attain a state of joy. I experience no stress, no anger. Notice my voice and my peace. Do you sense any anger? Do you sense any stress? Do you sense any fear? Or do you sense presence in this moment? This is how I am all the time. When I wake up in the morning, when I take a dump, I don't even clench. <laughs> I am peaceful like this and it just Soars out. When I'm in deep conversation, when there are crucial conversations that need to be had, I don't experience hunger. I'm not even tired. I transcend it all. And you can be like me for a simple investment. of X amount of dollars. The promised land is here. Don't fall for the hype. Just hand me your money and you shall be like me. And people fall for it. And then what happens, you start doing some of the work. There can actually be really amazing advice in this too, by the way, right? A lot of those like, again, terrible toxic teachers, we tend to view it as in, in a very binary way. We're like, ugh, but like, yeah, but some of what they say is actually really, really good. But they just use it in a terrible way. Right? Like Osho, I think the guy's insane. Beyond insane. But some of his books, some of my favorite books ever. Learn to discern. Something that's getting lost nowadays. Right? It's like if we don't, dis if we don't like the person, it means that everything they say, we can't like it. No, no, learn to discern. There's a lot of genius in what he says. Right? But people fall for that, and then what happens? They're like, Sensei, Guru Julian, I still experienced some fear yesterday. Well, that's because you didn't uh, pay enough. <laughs> I don't experience fear for a simple investment. Of <laughs> and that's the whole process. That's the conditioning. No joke. And people just spend and spend and spend, and they're promised this crazy non-realistic destination. Guess what? If you bought into that, you're stupid. You're gullible. You're dumb. That there is not reality. But what about transcending duality, Julian? That happens when you die. Guess what? All those people, just because they wear a robe, doesn't mean that they don't experience stress doesn't mean that they don't experience anger. I get stressed. I get angry. I experience fear. And guess what? That is good. That is human. Doing the opposite is actually disowning authentic parts of who you are. We all are born with an emotional guidance system. You would not be alive without it. What is telling you, if there's a cliff, don't walk off the cliff? What's telling you that? Fear, fear. fear. Yes. So why are you trying to say, I don't want fear. Teach me the ways, a simple investment for no fear. What's going to keep you from walking off that cliff then? Right? It's like if someone pulls out a gun, you're not going to meditate those bullets away. <laughs> it's like, there's a gun. A guru said, breathe into the fear.
right? That's what people do. No, that's good. But here's the problem. This is why it's very nuanced. Most of us don't actually experience our emotions as we should. You could think of it as, say there's a situation where you experience a certain amount of fear, okay? Let's just say this is what you experience. Here is the real amount of fear that you should be experiencing. But what happens is, on top of that, there's all this triggered, unrealistic fear. When you let go, you let go of the triggered, unrealistic part of it. Not the real part. You're still left with that, and that's good. And funny enough, your experience of that changes completely. Same with anger, right? What is anger? It's like a signal saying, hey, something's not good here. A boundary's been crossed. What if someone walked down the street and just spat on you? What if you didn't experience anger? Please spit on me again. No, that's good. It's like, whoa, that's not okay. But the problem is, instead of that activating at appropriate times, for a lot of us it just runs us or we just get stuck in that. Right? It's like in these new cars, um, you know, I have one where if, I, if I'm driving and suddenly a car pulls out in front of me really fast, it'll actually start beeping red. There's like a sound and a flash. It's like, doot, 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 like slow down, slow down. I like having that. I'm like, oh, thank you for the reminder. I saw it, but thank you for the reminder. You would not want to not have that. But what if that was on all the time? Do, 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 do. You're trying to go to sleep. Do, 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 do. You'd be like, just turn it off. Yeah. And someone's saying, hey, you can turn it off 24 seven for a simple investment. You'd be like, yes. But that's going against nature. That beautiful enlightened destination, old school spiritual conditioning is simply an escape. It's sold to poor souls. Like here's an escape from your problems. Here's the promised land, here's heaven. You'll never experience that ever. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to disown your emotions. It's not to get rid of them. It is, however, to change your relationship with them. That's letting go. Letting go of the unrealistic side. Letting go of the triggered side. Right? If, for example, you feel sad, what tends to happen is we feel bad about that. I should not be feeling sad. I was conditioned from a young age that feeling sad is not okay because when I felt sad, what did my parents say or whoever is raising me? They said, you shouldn't be feeling that. Oh, I shouldn't? Oh. And then what happens? You feel bad about feeling sad. And then you feel bad about feeling bad about feeling sad. And you feel bad about feeling bad about feeling bad about feeling sad. And it just brings you down. Picture a reality, just as a thought experiment, where from a very young age, you were taught that feeling sad was awesome. Right? Like technically, by the way, um, as a kid, if you actually experienced that, what do you want a parent to tell you if you're feeling sad? It's, hey, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. I'm going to stay here with you while you feel it. I'm going to support you as you feel that. That's actually what we want. It's not someone to say like, you're wrong for feeling that. Smile. You're like, put a smile on that face. You're like, okay, okay, daddy. That's not, no, right? But you actually want the support. Like someone to be like, hey, you can feel this. It's okay. And I'm here with you. Imagine a reality though, where feeling sad was the goal. Thought experiment. Imagine every video you've seen online is like how to feel sad. Three tips to feel sad. And whenever you see people feeling sad, it's like, that's a success story. It's like, here's my journey about how I was happy. And I put in a lot of work. It took a lot of years, a lot of hustle. And I finally made it to where I'm sad. <laughs> Say there's that reality. And you were born, again, conditioned that way. What would happen nowadays if you, if you felt sad today? You'd, feel happy. You'd be like, yes. And your experience of it would change completely. You'd actually enjoy it. There's no resistance to it. Get it? The problem is the resistance. So it's not sadness is an emotion, it's your relationship with it. You label it as bad and you're resistant and it just amplifies. Versus loving it and embracing it. The whole purpose of this work, what is true quote unquote enlightenment, is changing your relationship so you're in a state of love and acceptance towards whatever it is that you feel. Doesn't mean you won't feel that thing, but you'll have a realistic feeling and your relationship will change. And then your experience will change. So it's not to escape it, 
right? And then what's the point of life, too? If you're like, well, what if enlightenment, hypothetically, say, is real on earth, where you can transcend all that? Well, is that what life is about? Living on, quote-unquote, God mode? Would any of you want that? You might think temporarily, especially if you're in a bad place. You might be like, yes! But after a while, it'll get very boring. Right? If you think of playing a video game, imagine you're just playing a video game on God mode. Right? So he's like, doesn't matter where I aim, headshot, pop, pop. Boring. So boring. But if you suck at the game, though, at first, it's very tempting. Right? Say you just suck completely, like, I just want a headshot. What a terrible example, by the way, right? I just want a headshot in the game. God mode! Right? Or if you're like playing, what is it, Mario Kart? It's like, I just want the star. But if you're always on the star, you'd be like, get me out of this game. That would actually lead you towards a state of apathy. Those emotions, the ups and downs, that's what makes life life. That's what adds the depth, the excitement to this. But notice how that can be misinterpreted with letting go. We get sold on this false idea. Okay, so we get sold on the false idea. We buy into these things like, but Buddha, Buddha. I actually went to uh, Sri Lanka in 2019. It was right after, um, this is actually terrible, it was right after all the bombings there. It was my honeymoon. No joke, booked everything. There are all these bombings that targeted uh, churches, like I believe it was Catholic, Christian churches, and uh, tourist hotels. This is like two, three weeks before I was going to go. Tourism dropped. 90% plus, but hey, I still went. Um, so I went there and it was a crazy experience actually. Like we landed and we had a, a person who like drove us around and immediately right after we land, because uh, there was a curfew, we landed at night, we drive for 20 minutes from the airport and immediately we're just stopped. Like armed guards, machine guns, it's like, get out. And even the tour guide's like, just do what they say, do what they say. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, I'm like, what's going on? And we have like our passwords, like American, American. Like that was our honeymoon. Um, <laughs> now, it was actually good. Like that was the government just doing checkups to make sure and it, they, they let us go. But I was like, oh my God, what have we done? Um, but it was a, a, an amazing trip. We did that and then we did the Maldives right after. So we went around and we visited all these, um, you know, Buddhist temples and, and it was beautiful and it was inspiring. Um, but it was quite illuminating, and, and again, I, I get where people are coming from, but it was quite illuminating to see people going, for example, and praying to the Buddha, right? It's like uh, the guide would even tell us, like, you know, if you have a loved one, for example, who's sick, you're doing what you can, and last thing you can do is just pray to the Buddha, right? It's like, hey, please heal my loved one, and they'd bring offerings, and you do it for the monks, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of a tradition, I think that's amazing. I respect it. I love it. Just like any religion, I respect it. I love it. But... Notice how you could say you start giving your power away to this thing, this person, this idea. Buddha, do it for me. Now, one of the things Jed McKenna says in that book, and it's a very thought-provoking idea, is kill the Buddha. If you see the Buddha, kill it. Now, never ever say that in Sri Lanka at a temple. What does he mean by that? What do you think? Be inspired, learn from, but don't give your power away. Same with that idea of like, I need to let go. You're giving your power away to letting go. The Buddha, giving your power to Buddha. Jesus, giving your power away to Jesus. Be inspired, learn from them. But, don't put them on that pedestal and giving your power away. And he describes it as like, and it's not just him, right? Like Alan Watts talks about this a lot of people. It's a very common spiritual idea. And it's described as like the final boss, right? It's like, and, and to be clear, there's different advice for different paradigms. For someone at the bottom, right? Or if you're in a very hopeless state, praying to the Buddha is amazing. Absolutely amazing and definitely do that. Whatever gets you out of that hole, do it. No shame in it, own that. But once you start rising up to a level, as you move up, advice changes. As you start letting go, you start gaining a lot more personal power. And the final boss, you can't even kill the Buddha at the bottom. Once you're at the top, that's when it's time. And it's not in a bad way where you're like, screw you, Buddha. It's more of like, you know what? Thank you, but I'm taking the power back. 
It's not something external. It's within me. There's a Buddha within you. There's a Jesus within you. There's a whatever within you. But you have the power. And literally what he says is when you see it, take Buddha, grab him, as I throw my shoe off, tackle him, and rip his head off. Take Buddha's head and put it on a pike. And every morning, look at that bleeding skull as a reminder. The power is within you. Same with letting go. You're letting go. It's not the technique, it's you. Buddha's not this pedestal, da da da, like supernatural being. It's a person just like you. What one person can do, another person can do. Don't use it as this, again, thing to just keep self attacking, like, but I'm not like him. I'm not one of the enlightened ones. I'm not like Osho. I don't have a Rolls Royce for every day of the year. Right? It's crazy, right? That was his following. It's like, we want to give him a Rolls Royce for every day of the year because Osho loves Rolls Royces. <laughs> right? People also go this route too if you're in that idol, right? It's like, I idolize the Buddha. It's like people try to mimic them. They don't see and they aren't inspired by what someone like that has internally achieved. They're like, well, what does the Buddha eat? Let me eat what he eats. Then I'll achieve what he achieved. What does he wear? Right? You'll see that if you ever go to uh, Tulum, Mexico. What does everyone wear there? The shaman robes, because that's what's spiritual. That's actually a big reason why I personally like mixing it up. You'll see me wear like wacky robes. You'll see me wear the most materialistic clothes there is. Gucci. That's literally the most materialistic brand in my mind. I'm like, what's the most obnoxious brand that just screams materialistic and money? Gucci. And it drives the spiritual crowd nuts. And I love it. Because I just rock up, again, just dripping in gooch. And I just start dropping knowledge, like the deepest spiritual knowledge. And their brain's like, it doesn't compute. He's not wearing the Tulum clothes. How could he say that? Right? And um, it also drives the, the people who are more materialistic insane too, because they're just all like, you know, spiritual people, they don't make money, they're just meditating. And when they see someone talk about that, and then there's the emblem of like, oh, there's also, you know, material success, it kind of like messes people's mind. I like that, the one foot in each, right? Rich internally, rich externally, successful internally, successful externally. But to do that, it's like, take the power back in you. You're the hero. Be inspired, but also be realistic. Give the power to you, not to someone else. And this could also apply to all areas of life, right? One thing I've seen for years, and this is so sad, is someone might start working on their social skills because, you know, say they, they, they got out of a really toxic relationship where they really suffered a terrible breakup. Anyone get into working on their social skills from a breakup, by the way? Raise your hand. A lot of people, right? Now here's the trap. You come out of a breakup and you're like, you know what, this sucks. I want to better myself, work on my social skills. Uh, I want to meet more people. And you start doing that. But why are you doing it? To get over my ex. So the more action you take, where's your investment going? Towards the ex. The more you try to get over your ex, the more you start thinking about your ex. Because everything you do is for the ex. Versus for you. The same with, I'm going to work on my social skills to be better socially. If you're doing it to get people to like you, that will actually make you more outcome focused. Because now you're like, look, I spent years working on this. Work. And you become even needier. Because you're giving your power away. Whatever you do is for who? You. So track where the investment's going. And then if you really want to think how I view this idea of enlightenment, right? Like, sure, right? You could argue like non-duality, transcendence, da, da, da. But that's like death. What is true enlightenment? It's the classic saying, being in this world, but not of this world. More specifically, one foot in the physical, one foot in where you came, one foot in your essence. 
Best way to compare it is to a video game. Right? Take Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption, one of those like, you know, first, like little free roaming video games. When you play a video game like that, whether you've ever played one or not, there's the character that you're operating, running around. Then there's you as the player. That's life. Most of us, we only live life identified as the character, experiencing life through the character. For the character, the experience playing the game is very heavy, very serious, right? As the character, as you start leveling up, your self-worth enhances. What about as the player? Does it enhance you as a player the more your character levels up? Right? If you're like, my character got from uh, level one to level three, and the next day you're like, I'm a better person! <laughs> no. As a player, do you like the ups and downs and the challenges that you're going through playing this game? Do you like experiencing fear playing a game? Yes. Yeah. Do you like even experiencing frustration when you can't pass a certain thing and you have to dedicate some time and attention to it? Right? What if it was just super easy and flat? You're just like straight line, you won, done. Boring. Life's the same way. We're just too used to living it through the character's perspective. We've got to zoom out and have one foot in the player. That's your self-worth. That's true, quote unquote, enlightenment. It's changing your relationship, for example, with the emotions. Away from the character experiencing it to the player experiencing it. In terms of your self-worth, right? Sure, can the character level up? Yes. Every single one of you here, you can cultivate more skills. Am I, for example, good enough to be a surgeon? Yes or no? no. Are you saying you wouldn't trust me to operate on you? Yes. Really? Am I not good enough to operate on you? Yeah, I wouldn't have you operate on me. Really? <laughs> good. Yeah, I'm not good enough for that. Does that mean my worth as a human is not good enough? No. no. Same here. As the player, you're good enough just because. You can level up as much as you want within the game. Doesn't affect your self-worth as a human. Same here, but we lose that. And then we just try to move up. Like, the better my skills, the better I am. Right? So this whole video game is like the best way to describe it. That's quote unquote enlightenment. It's not withdrawing from the game. It's not having no emotions. It's still being in this world. But your relationship with the world, with your emotions, with everything, including yourself, changes. And that fortunately is what more and more people are starting to move towards. Less and less people are buying into that old school spirituality. Less and less people are like, Buddha, I will be a supernatural being like you. Less and less people are like, for a simple price of da da da, no, it's like, no. But that's the realistic view, that's the goal. Don't disown your emotions. Don't avoid taking action either. That's like playing the video game and being like, yeah, now that I'm enlightened, no action, and you just, set the controller down. That's not life. Life is, you're here, you're immersed in this experience, partake in it, take action in it. That's why you're here, right? You can even think of life as like this detention room where we're all here till the day we die, all of us. What are you gonna do during that time? It's like someone sat you down and that was your punishment or even a reward, you could say, you're gonna sit here and you're gonna play this video game for X amount of years. You can resist that all you want. I don't want to play the game. That's like someone in apathy. I don't want to live life. You wake up in the morning. No, another day. Doesn't matter. You're, you're going to play this. You could be like, I am in line. And you're just going to take deep breaths and your character is staying idle. That's not the point either. A lot of people, though, they then go where it's like, well, what's the right way to live life to get validation, to get money? And that's like playing GTA, trying to collect as much money as you can, doing all the taxi cab missions, right? I need the better clothes for my character. You can do that if you want, but ultimately it's like, hey, what's gonna give you a good experience playing this game? That's life. What's gonna give you a good experience playing this thing called life? We're all gonna return the game, right? You're embarked on this ride. The ride is your body. You're gonna have to return that too. You're gonna return everything, whatever you accumulate, whatever you gather. You're going to have to turn your body. You're going to have to return your outwardly successes. 
You're going to have to return your legacy. You're going to have to return all the knowledge you accumulated, all the skills you accumulated, everything that has to do with that character, you're going to have to give it back. So in the end, it's, hey, what's the experience? And ultimately, too, if you even zoom out where it's like from a player's perspective, right, or from a, a soul's perspective, or even, say, Christianity, it's like from a spirit's perspective, what's the spiritual journey? What's the soul's journey? What's the player's journey through this game? That doesn't mean that everything external should always be, always be nice and simple and peachy. Sometimes you'll go through a lot of adversity. Sometimes everything you know about your character and that life will just crumbles. And from a material character perspective, it seems like everything's going downhill. But perhaps from a more player spirit perspective, that's what elevates you as a spirit. What's that experience you're going to go through so that when it ends, something changed on a spirit level? That's how I personally view it. And it's very easy to get nihilistic with this. you are like, well, what's the point then? Because it's true, right? If you think about it, every single one of us here, you know what, at the end we get the same thing. No matter what you do, by the way, what you do. We all die. That's the guarantee of life. You can try to survive as much as you want. None of us survive. To quote Jim Morrison in The Doors, five to one, no one here gets out alive. None of us. Can't take anything with you. And it can be sad, right? It's like, well, then what? Why? Why do anything? Well, why not do anything? Detention. You're stuck here anyway. This can be very sad and can lead you to nihilism. But when you're at that point, you're also on the brink towards some kind of awakening where it could actually be very freeing and liberating. If you think of GTA, that's like completing all the missions and say you're free roaming at the end. You're like, but I need missions. What's the point otherwise? Well, now there are no imposed missions on you. Now you can come up with your own authentic missions. Because imagine if there was an imposed mission on everyone. Maybe it's not one that you authentically resonate with. Maybe you're like, I don't want that mission. Now that you're free roaming, you're free to come up with your own mission that actually gives you joy and fulfillment. And everyone should come up with missions too, by the way. Everyone should have goals. And this is why I keep saying when I say the outcome, the goal, it's not about accomplishing it, it's what it does to the process. Having an outcome enhances the process. Free roaming in GTA Coming up with little missions for yourself, it doesn't matter if you accomplish them or not, you don't get anything. It doesn't enhance you. But having missions makes it fun versus boring and free roaming, kind of going around in circles. Same in life. Come up with your own missions authentic to you. Come up with a purpose authentic to you. And it's not about winning that mission because when you win it, you'll come up with a new one and a new one and a new one and a new one and then you die. It's about what it does to your experience here alive. Right? And then... Another perspective with this is being honest with yourself too, where every single one of us, we are the player, but we're also the character at the same time. And our characters are different. All of us here, we are equal in terms of the player, equal in terms of self-worth, but we are not necessarily equal in terms of specific aspects of life. All of us here, for example, some of you, are gonna be beating the rest of us when it comes to math, straight up. Some of you are gonna be beating the rest of us when it comes to sports. Every single one of us, we have strengths, we have weaknesses, we all do. Now we tend to be more aware <laughs> of our weaknesses versus our strengths, or we try to focus on strengths that we don't have, and by obsessing with strengths that we don't have, we miss the ones that we do have. But familiarize yourself with your character. Right? I love this video game perspective. It's like, imagine some of us were born, like if you take a, a Warcrafty video game, it's like some of us are knights. Some of us are like magician, mage, and stuff, right? Some of us are like the medic, healer, da da da. It's like we, we each have a certain avatar, if that makes sense. But then, again, we're like, say you're like the, the mage doing all the spells, you're like, I wanna be the warrior, why am I not the warrior? And then you feel like a victim. Playing to your character. And your character, this is the other big one, your character doesn't determine your experience playing the game. 
It's like, uh, you know, you can't choose the cards you're dealt. But at the same time, is the purpose of playing a game. Like, anyone play cards? Yes? No? I actually play, um, it's more European. There's this game called, it's like, you know, tarot cards? There's actually a game in, in, in France and Switzerland called tarot. It's, it's, an amazing, it's a super fun game. But um, say you're dealt certain cards. Or say you're playing poker or something. You're dealt certain cards. Maybe one person gets two aces. Maybe another person gets a two and a three. Does that determine who's going to have more fun? No. Maybe for the person with the two aces, you could say that could even rob some of the fun. Because like, eh, I won anyway. Yeah. Less at stake. At the end, too, since there is no true winning, we all get the same result, death. Just because you have a two and a three doesn't mean your experience won't be amazing. Make that work. Get creative. Get in touch with your character and get creative and realize it's not about how much you win. It's not about even how many skills your character has. It's about your experience playing it. You can resist and fight it as much as you want. Like, oh, the two and the three, why? And that's people in life. And they just cry and cry over those cards. They never play them. They look at others, they're like, look, another ace and another ace, Ugh, like that. And then the, the game's over. Or you can be like, okay, two and three, let's go. Let's go, let's, let's, let's make it happen. There could even be cards that are so bad, you're like, look, I'm not going to win anyway, but it doesn't matter. I could still have a great time playing. That's life. Hey, here are your cards. Is life necessarily quote unquote fair? No. But you can choose to cry over it, or you can have that attitude where, hey, bring it. I'm going to have a great time playing. And there are benefits to whatever cards you have. The person with two aces will have experiences that you won't have. But you will also have experiences that someone with two aces will not have either. Guess what? A lot of you here, most likely you're here because you've gone through something pretty bad. It might have been one event, or it might have been a series of small events where you're like, you know what? Enough. There was that final one that, again, the straw that broke the camel's back. You're like, enough. And it created the opening where you're like, I want to start working on myself. And you embarked in this world. You embarked in this self-help world. You embarked in this spiritual world. You probably had a lot of crazy experiences, a lot of crazy insights, even going through all that, that a lot of people who didn't go through the same things you went through never had. And there's probably a part of you that's a little thankful for that. Look at all the people who don't even know about this. The people who never introspect. The people who even like, they had it so easy, the two aces. Sure, right, they could have a great life, but hey, what about all this depth that you have now? What about all these perspectives? What about the lessons? You could even say the pain that you go through can even serve as the largest lesson or the largest gift. Right? There was a client I had, this is a few years ago. She was saying, you know, it's like uh, talking about like all this hardship that she went through, so on and so forth. And for the longest time, she thought like life cursed her and it was so unfair, so on and so forth. And then she realized, you know what, this actually might be the, the greatest gift because she learned so much from it and that actually became her purpose, where she could help others from what she learned, from what she went through. I can definitely relate to that. Some of my worst times alive turned out to be the best times, in retrospect. Same for you here. Some of those like terrible moments led to this whole shift in the way that you're living your life. And you're probably looking back like, thank God. Thank God that happened, or else. Right? So play the game. Immerse yourself. Whatever cards you have. You can even use that as more motivation to play this. Right? Say you have the two and the three. Well, better step it up then. And have that attitude. What I say too is someone who's in this victimhood, grief state of mind. Say, you, another video game analogy. Say you're playing a, a level and you keep failing at this one point. Right? Say there's a, a, something you have to jump over and you fall on the cliff every time. You fall, you fall, you fall. One person... It's going to be like, ah, screw this, and throw the controller and feel sad and go cry. It's too hard. You might have had a moment like that. A lot of the action steps you must take for your character to level up, they're not comfortable. But you have a choice. You could be like, it's too hard, yeah, whatever. Can someone do it for me? Please, self-help teacher, government, Buddha, someone do it for me. Jump the thing over me, please. 
Or, here's another person. With every time you fall, it lights that fire in you. That fire in the gut. That fire in the belly. With every time you fall, you're like, again. Again. More. More. And you just keep on going until you win. That's the approach towards life. Those cards, two and three, more. And said, oh, it sucks. Like, well, better step it up. And my experience alive, having that approach, that healthy fire, that step it up, will actually lead to a much more fulfilling and deep life than if I had the two aces to begin with. And it's a choice. Realize, too, a lot of this, you can ask yourself, like, well, is that actually true? And blah, 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 blah. Like, well, what if there are actually, you know, better cards and stuff? Like, sure, there could be better cards. One thing that I fortunately realized, not early, early on, but still in the first few years of working myself, was it doesn't matter if something's true or not. What matters is, does this help me? Who cares if it's true? Does this perspective help me? Does this belief help me? The answer is yes, done. Take it on. Now don't use this. Any piece of advice can also be used to hurt you, right? Help you or hurt you. Like, you can also be like super <laughs> naive and dumb with this. Use common sense, obviously. Like, don't get delusional. Like, oh yeah, everything helps me, right? Um, if, I, if I step over a cliff, I choose to believe I won't fall. It's like, no, be smart. But for most of the time, like a lot of the self-help advice, like the perspectives, does this help me? Yes. Look for proof that it helps you. Reinforce that versus the opposite. A lot of it's just a choice. And then the last thing I'll say too is, there are times where, yeah, you might feel discouraged. Times you're like, ugh, can I do this? There are times where even me to this day, I'll look back at everything I went through, everything. I'm like, wow. And, and let me know if you feel this way, I'm actually curious. Do you ever look back at your life and you're like, everything you've gone through, the challenges, the adversity, the things you had to figure out, the things you had to deal with, all that to stay alive this long. And you look at your life and then you look at the future and you're like, a lot more years to go. How am I going to do this? Anyone feel that way? Okay. I feel like that sometimes too. And it doesn't mean the life won't be hard. But taking this player character perspective, you actually want it to be a little hard. And at the same time, too, if there's that little voice like, it's too hard, remind yourself, look, you're going to return this game at some point. You have all of eternity to be dead. All of eternity. While you're alive, make the best of it, because it'll fly by. Same as when we're playing a, a video game, right? It's like, I just want to skip to the end. Ugh. It's like when you're at the end, you're like, man, I wish I was still playing it. Right? Don't do that with life. And this other point too, it's like you're going to have to return the game, do take it in. Because we tend to live and make decisions as if we have forever. Audit every single one of you. Anything, any of your goals you're putting off in someday land. Someday dot dot dot. What are all those things? Someday I'll be happy. Someday this. Someday I'll take action. Someday my life will this. Someday I'll be, you know, be the person I want to be. Someday, 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 someday. You know, he said, kill the Buddha. Kill someday land. I believe it's Brian Tracy who says there's like someday isle, island or something like that. Bomb that island. No someday. Now. That's also the saying, right? Die before you die. It's crazy that a lot of people have regrets on their deathbed. If you have regrets on your deathbed, shame on you. Now, to be fair, there can be regrets that you have where it's like out of your control, of course. But if it's regrets that are in your control, the most common one people have is, I wish I would have allowed myself to be happier. If that's you and you die, shame on you. I wish I would have allowed myself to take more action. Shame on you. That's in your control. Do that now. Stop putting it off. People who arrive at their deathbed thinking that, it's because they placed all that in someday land. Never, ever have someday land. It's all right here, right now. And I know I said last thing, but actually a last, last thing. And this is a big, uh, you could say a final trap with letting go in spirituality. People sometimes ask, you know, Julian, 
guru. When will I let go completely? Anyone want to know the answer? Anyone think that? Hey, when, 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 is there a point where you like let go completely? What's that like? Enlightened one, what's it like? Right? Now here's the thing. The goal is not to let go completely. That's the first thing I'll say. If that's your goal, you're confusing it. The goal is not to let go of everything, to let go completely. The goal is for what letting go does to your life. It's to live a fulfilling life, a joyful life, an authentic life. Otherwise, you're just using letting go as another requirement. I must do this, I must do this to be happy, I must do this to be happy, and I must let go of everything and let go completely to be happy. No. And then the second one is, when will I let go completely? What's, uh, here's the true answer. You might have heard some other people say that. I, be, I believe um, Eckhart Tolle says that too. It's like, Eckhart, Ecky boy, when will I let go completely, wise one? And he, and he looks at you and he's like, when you stop asking the question. Does that frustrate anyone, that answer? It's like a riddle. Like, what? what do you mean when I stop asking the question? <laughs> what a comeback. Imagine you just say that to anyone. Hey, Julian, so um, what should I do there? You'll know when you stop asking the question. <laughs> um, but there's actually a lot of genius in it, too, because if you ask yourself, okay, what's motivating the, when will I let go completely? It's technically resistance to the right here, right now. It's self-hate. The more you hate yourself right here, right now, the more you want to let go and achieve the promised land. As you start letting go, what happens? You start loving yourself. You start loving the right here, right now. The more you love yourself, guess what? Is there still that need to be somewhere else? If you loved right here, right now, is there a part of you that's like, I want to be over there? No. So the more you start loving yourself, the more whole you become. Suddenly that question just stops popping in. You don't have to make yourself not think it. It just stops kicking in. Right? Do you have to make yourself, for example, uh, you know, think, uh, I'm trying to think of something funny. Any of you ask yourself, like, what did Julian eat for breakfast today? Wise one, what did you eat for breakfast? Do you have to make yourself not think that, or does it just not pop in your mind? Just doesn't pop in your mind. I hope. Someone's like, I have to make myself not think about it. <laughs> just tell us. If we eat the same breakfast as the wise one, we shall be wise. No, it just doesn't pop in your mind. Right? Same there. When will I let go? When will I let go? When will I let go? Self-hate, self-hate, self-hate. Less self-hate, suddenly it stops popping in because you're happy where you are. That's how it works. That's this whole process. Where's the promised land? It's not in the future. It's not in Buddha. It's right here. It's not in letting go. Right here, right now. And one thing people say is like, you know, all this stuff tells you you're not good enough. It's like, no, the whole point of letting go is realizing that you are good enough right now. It's letting go of everything that's telling you you're not. It's snapping out a first-person perspective to third-person perspective, from character to player. That's the whole thing. You're born good enough. You tell yourself you're not, and then you live trying to justify your existence. To your parents, to society, to the universe, to God, you name it. Live. And letting go is not the destination, it's the starting point. It's the platform from which you thrive and live and crush this thing called life. This here is very nuanced, but this is the truth when it comes to spirituality. Take notes, I hope you did. Come back to these notes. Few people will say it. People will try to dumb it down. Like I said in the beginning, just uh, breathe, letting go is just breathing. Or it's promised land. Right? So much of that conditioning. There was even a client recently who was like, you know, Julian, I, um, <laughs> how did he start? He, he, um, he, he was like, Julian, you know, I, um, I have a question. I'm enlightened. I'm like, okay. And uh, I have trouble relating to the world. I'm like, okay. You know, I look around and I'm just so disgusted. This wretched place and all these people beneath me. I'm like, doesn't sound like you're enlightened. <laughs> He's like, no, no, no. And ultimately, he's using all these ideas to just not work on himself. 
And I even asked him, okay, well, well, who are you? He's like, I am the consciousness experiencing the all. Like literally just regurgitating these lines. Not willing to face what's inside. Not willing to even accept, like, maybe there's such a thing as an emotional guidance system. Right? There's another client who's like, this is always week one, then we kind of shake this out of them. But another one who's like, I am always in a state of joy. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, yes, and I want to reach an even higher state. I'm like, well, let's start uh, by focusing if there's any grief within you. There isn't, only joy. <laughs> See, you just stay in such denial, right? And then people, their ego takes pride in it. Even if you take like these scales, right? There are many scales. There's spiral dynamics for one. Study these, they're very interesting. There's spiral dynamics. There's the David Hawkins scale of consciousness. There's Frederick Dodson, another scale, right? There's many. These scales are great. Mine is a little different. I tweaked up a few levels based upon what I've seen in my experience, but I've also simplified it. In my scale, there are only eight levels, that's it. And the one that's at the top, I put love, and when I explain it to clients, love is what we talked about here. You still experience anger, fear, grief, so on and so forth, even desire. But people fall into that dumbed down spiritual conditioning, they don't see that. They're like, no, 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 when you're in love, you don't have that. But, but Frederick Dodson says, but David Hawkins says, but Buddha says, and they use this scale as this like, you know, dick measuring contest. It's like, I'm in this, where are you? I'm in this, I'm better, and it's just this ego enhancement. Terrible. So it's not moving up. It's not, I'm better than. It's shifting out even of this competitive. That's what the ego says, you must be better than. Even entering spirituality, you will let go of all that and then people will see you are the guru and they will look up in envy. Screw that. It's not vertical, it's horizontal. A state of love experiencing all emotions. That's what it's about. Okay, so I hope this woke up some stuff within you here. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, always hesitant doing these types of speeches too because you never know if it does click or if it does relate. Again, people are at different levels, different paradigms. Um, if you're ready to listen to this and it clicked, thank you, like for real. Like I'm happy when I say this and this type of advice doesn't go to waste. I'm happy when it clicks, I'm happy when it resonates. So for those of you who are ready, thank you for being ready. Put it to use and don't let mainstream spiritual conditioning steer you astray. Don't fall into those traps either, okay? Letting go, remember, doesn't mean not taking action. It means taking more action, but healthy, authentic action that feels a lot more effortless. That's also how you truly crush it, by the way, right? If you think, for example, this speech here, does it technically require, like, is it a lot of work to, to do what I just did? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, definitely is. Did it feel like a lot of work for me doing it? No. no. That's what happens, like when, on one hand, you engage with what's authentic to you, but number two, when you start letting go of all that resistance and self-attack and self-judgment, right? I'm sure you've heard of like, decision fatigue, so on and so forth, judgment fatigue, you let go of all that, you can take a ton of action that doesn't feel like it, right? Um, one last example, when I was in school growing up, I remember there was like some assignments where, say I had to do five minutes of homework for, I don't know, so I'm like, I grew up in Switzerland, let's just say French class, five minutes assignment. It would feel like days to do those five minutes, days. I hated every second. It required so much effort. I had to battle so much inner resistance and procrastination, it was terrible. But then, I was really into music back then. I could spend all night working on music, right? I got this program called Pro Tools back in the day and I would figure it out and read up, you know, like tutorials on how to use it. And if you objectively looked at it, five minutes of French, all nighter of this music program, what's more work? Music program but it felt effortless. 
just flowed. You get lost in the moment, it's like time flies by. That's how you get to do a ton of action. It's not by self-attacking and battling all this inner resistance, it's by shifting to that gear where it just feels like nothing. Right, same with that video game. You could probably play a video game for hours and hours and hours. Probably a lot of you do. Does it feel like a lot of work? Technically it is. You're like, but it's a game. Yeah, but it's still a lot of work. Imagine if you could have that same feeling towards goals that actually move you ahead. Also, what this means is, although I allude a lot to video games, make your life and treat your life that way. This is something my friend uh, Mario Tomic talks about. He's a fitness guy. Amazing advice. Um, he's like, he, he used to be a huge video game addict, right? And people ask him like, you know, how did you, do you quit your addiction to video games? And he's like, I realized that life is a video game. Why am I spending all this time optimizing some digital character when I could be optimizing this character here? What if you treated life this way? It's like, here you are, this is your avatar. What are you gonna do to level up today? Right, like people play like fucking World of Warcraft. It's like, today I need to go hunting to practice my hunting skills and gather this. And that's all they do all day. Hey, do that in life. What are you going to do in life to do that? Optimize this one. Trust me, there's so much experience out here versus in there. Even though society is moving you more towards that direction. Is this awakening? Are you talking about awakening? Is this what that is? What's awakening? There are no higher perspectives. Well, um, realizing you have an old partial perspective and reaching out to include more perspectives, like the yes and part of it. Yeah. The meta programming of like the looking at your own systems and stuff. From that uh, third person objective, or like we're now going out to more perspectives. I like some of that, um, and I'll answer it. So it's a great question. I like some of that, but also notice, and I hope everyone catches it too, the spiritual conditioning running you. Is that awakening? Is this in the paradigm and this bill leaf? And the, it's like, think of it as like, yes, this is what I would break down. What we talked about here is quote unquote enlightenment. A lot of spiritual people will disagree massively. They'll be like, no, it's not the Buddha. They'll literally say that, right? If I release this, literally all the comments would be like, well, what about this person, right? They attained enlightenment. Um, funny little joke too. A lot of the people who say that, like here, here's how a YouTuber attains enlightenment. You're gonna see a video where they'll, right, it's like imagine I'm at my, I keep my, my phone, I'm like filming. If you ever see a video like this, you know I'm, in, I'm enlightened. So imagine I just did a ton of drugs, because that's what they do. High as a kite, microdosing ayahuasca every two hours. And I'm like, everyone? I realize I'm not me, I'm not the body, I'm not thought, oh my god, it's happening, oh. and then just go on psycho rants like, you're not the body, you're not the soul, you're not this, you're not Buddha, you just have to realize you're no mind, no mind, and people fall for this shit. They're like, that must be enlightenment. Literally, everyone who says they're enlightened, they look like drug addicts. And most of the time, behind the scenes, they are. <laughs> right? It's crazy. And then you got to ask yourself there, too, like, is that the result you want? Right? It's like, if that's actually enlightenment, is that what you want? Can you function in life that way? Right? I've even seen people take it over the top where they're like, again, this is how you can use advice that's meant to help you to hurt you. Right? It's like you hear, we are all one. Right? We are all connected. What's your, like you are me and I am you. Your money is mine. <laughs> right? Or, I've even seen people like, my money is everyone's. And there's some fucking psych, like they'll, they'll like give money, it's so dumb. Like so, don't fall for that. That's like, I, I feel like that's the 2020, 2021 enlightenment is like high as fuck on drugs. <laughs> right, and just yelling in the camera and just, yelling about how enlightened they are. Uh, but then the other one is like this whole like awakening. So like what you said, it's like you're moving up. No, no, no. No moving up. That's old school. You're down here, you want to move up. True enlightenment 
is a moving, you could say even down, it's a moving into yourself. It's a sinking into you. It's not becoming, it's realizing. Feeling more whole, taking up more space inside, feeling more okay being you. Movement towards, not away from. That's also a great audit when you're trying to say let go is whatever you're feeling, are you trying to move away from it or get rid of it? That's why people scream when they're angry, right? If you try to solve an argument when you're triggered, you're actually not trying to solve the argument. You're trying to get rid of what you feel by screaming and putting on someone else. Or while you drink and you try to numb what you're feeling. Or even if you're trying to let go, you're like, I don't like this, let me let go. Shh, trying to get rid of it. That's a movement away from me. Versus, I'm letting go of the resistance to move towards, to feel. I don't like where I am. I want to move up the levels of consciousness. Move away from. No, no, no. Moving towards. The way you move up is by moving towards. Yeah, real fast. Well, you should, uh, keep going back to enlightenment. Are awakening and enlightenment not different things? Tomato, tomato. I don't know. Give whatever word you want. So that's like dogmatic following, right? It's like, is joy and happiness the same? Well, I'm looking for the uh, explain it like a five version for the world. Don't. You're trying to logically comprehend it. It's like, you could say enlightenment, you could say awakening. It does, what does it matter? You could even call it poo poo bird. <laughs> that is poo poo bird. What I just explained here is poo poo bird. You get it? Here's enlightenment, here's awakening, here's poo poo bird. <laughs> that should literally be the scale. It's like what I taught here is poo poo bird, everyone. <laughs> you will all achieve poo poo bird. <laughs> Screw awakening. Imagine if that took off too. It's like then you'll see all the people like, everyone, I've achieved poo poo bird. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, the message, like pick your own word, it doesn't matter. Literally, I could go with poo poo bird. It's not about the words. Fuck the definition. That's what I'm telling you. Fuck the definition. You're not here for the definition. You're here for the experience. You don't get a definition across. That helps no one. Share an experience. Teach them how to reach that experience. That's why books don't do fuck all for anyone. Everyone reads the book Letting Go. Everyone's power now. No one's present. Just words. Right? You could say, here's the definition. Enlightenment is letting go of all attachment and all aversions. Great, what does that do? Nothing. Definitions don't do shit. Experiences do. So poo poo bird is the way. Never forget. <laughs> yes? Uh, so I have a lot of people around me talk about like, how they're tired all the time and not. Do you think as you let go more, you have less like, in, in your brain and you have more energy? Or is that just like a frame of following you? Yeah, you'll, uh, you'll waste a lot less mental bandwidth obsessing over stuff that doesn't matter, getting triggered. But you'll still need to sleep. Poo poo bird won't save you from sleep. Yeah. But you could say all the unrealistic energy burning, that'll fade away. All of us here, by the way, due to conditioning, none of you feel like you're good enough. None of you. Some of you might feel like you're a little bit, you could say, better enough than others, but none of you feel whole. That's every single human alive. I could talk for hours on this in terms of the process of socialization. None of us do. So think of it like this. Instead of being whole, there's a piece missing within you. And then we try to find this piece, not by letting go, because what we do is we take that piece and we're like, that's not me. Not internally, but we try to seek it externally. And the more someone embodies what you disown within you, the more you place them on a pedestal. My partner will complete me. <gasps> the more I value, oh, that will do to me. So we try to like externally fulfill inner needs. This is neediness, by the way. And this could be a person, or you could think of it as like you put it behind a certain goal. And after the fact, like then I'm whole, right? Um, this could be a person, a goal, a, a thing, certain amount of money. That's neediness. I need it, I need it, I need it. As you let go, you become whole. You dissolve that split within. And now you see the world for what it is. And you could see someone else, but there's no longer that same need. There could be an intention. Hey, I want to say hi to that person. Hey, I want to talk to that person. I want to network with that person. Great. But before and after, you're whole and you're whole. So that's neediness. They have something 
that will fill that void that you need. The more they have it, the more they're on a pedestal. True change is, and I teach this to my clients, you know, say they go through the mentoring, they'll look back at the end, and it's like subtle change that sneaks up on you. Change that can almost be hard to catch, where you look back and you're like, I thought I was always like this, I guess not, right? Like say you journal your progress. When you thought you were always like this, it's permanent. That means it's fully you, it's not new, it's not foreign, it's not like, oh my God, look at this now, whoa, because that's still not you, right? So that's how you know it's permanent. You'll still have little boosts where it's like, oh shit, this is not me. Use that, but true change sneaks up on you and you catch it looking back. If it does feel like it's still not you, the fear of losing it, the fear of going backwards, the fear of if I stop taking action, everything will crumble, then you're building it on a wrong foundation and that is not permanent. That's not the success you want. In terms of how to let go of that, what I found is, right, did you join the mentoring? Join it. Yeah, you were in that room, dude, join it. Like, no excuse if that's it, like, is doing that deep sweep. Because some of those success barriers could be linked to grief. Some could be fear. Some could be anger. Some could be desire, neediness. So by doing that, like, say you take, right, success barriers, huh, or even self-sabotage, all that, like, say, say it's like this big glob. This might be grief. This, fear, right? This anger, this desire. By doing the sweep, going through the eight weeks, you slowly start chopping away, chopping away, chopping away, chopping away. That's the way to do it. That's what I tell my clients, like this self-sabotage, and as they go through it, they're like, it's just gone. Oh, success rate, just gone. Hell yeah. I'm only saying this too because I chatted him in the back yesterday. I was like, dude, do it. Yeah. For any of you here too, it's like, do it. Don't put this off. For real. Um, this is the most important work in my opinion. People are like, sometimes say like, well, didn't you achieve some success without all this? I'm like, yeah, I did. But I also sabotaged and lost it all. <laughs> I was good at fighting self-sabotage. That was it. And here's the thing. Yes, I achieved some success without this but you're looking at the wrong thing. I would have achieved a lot more with this. My success looking back before this, it's like looking at pennies. It's like, didn't you make like a few pennies without this? Yeah, but you don't see the lost opportunity. <laughs> don't compare it to zero. Oh sure, it's better than zero. What are a few pennies compared to a few thousand? Same with you, like, well, didn't you achieve a certain amount of social skills? It's like. My social skills back then are a joke compared to what they are now. A joke. I find it funny, people are like, you're old infield. I'm like, you think that was good? Pfft, your standards are low, very low, if you think that was good. That is 20% of what I am here today. Letting go. I went, like, if you've known me for a while, I am the most like result, like whatever gets the fucking result. Letting go. I wouldn't be hyping it otherwise. It's the most result producing thing. As I said, not to be misinterpreted with no action. If that's the case, then, as we talked about earlier, fuck you. <laughs> Couple it with action, though. Yeah. <laughs> Eyes closed and start by taking a few deep breaths, letting things settle. Few deep breaths, letting things slow down making each breath last a little longer than the previous breath. Each inhale lasts a little longer. Each exhale lasts a little longer. Letting things slow down, getting present. And I want you to bring your awareness to what it feels like to be you in this moment. What's that like? Being the person you are, living the life you lived, 
having gone through some of the experiences that you've gone through, what's it been like for you? What's life been like for you? Has it been easy? Has it been hard? Has it been fun? Has it been light? What's it been like? And what's it like being you in this moment right now, sitting here in this room listening to my voice? And is there any resistance to being you? Resistance to being the person you are? Resistance to your life situation? Resistance to what you're feeling inside? Needing to feel differently? I need to feel better. I need to be better. I need to do more. I need to be more. Bring your awareness to any resistance. I need more money. I need more success. Is there any resistance to what is? I need to look differently, be differently, act differently. Any resistance to your friendship situation? Any resistance to your relationship situation? Any resistance to your financial situation? Any resistance to your health situation? And is there any self-attack associated to that? Beating yourself up? Always being so hard on yourself? Is there any self-attack happening right now in this moment? What comes up? Any judging? Any criticizing? And what comes up when you hear me ask you, can you let go of this right here, right now? Can you let go of always being so hard on yourself, beating yourself up, criticizing yourself? Can you let go of any and all resistance right here, right now? Any and all resistance to being you, being the person you are, living the life you live? And let's get ready to do a cycle here, opening up to these sensations. On the inhale, letting them take over, allowing yourself to experience them fully, tune into them, and inhale now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold for three. Let it go. Shh. Two, three, four, five. Six, hold for three again, and breathe normally. And what comes up when you hear me ask you, could you love and embrace yourself unconditionally? Are there any parts of you that you still resist, that you hate? Any younger versions of you? What are some of the younger versions of you that you hate the most? Those younger versions that just ruined everything. Why did I do this? Why didn't I do that? Why did I say that? Why didn't I say that? Why didn't I do more? Why wasn't I stronger? Why wasn't I smarter? How could I have let that happen? Those younger versions where, if only, how your life would have been so different. What are some of those younger versions of you that you resist and perhaps hate the most? Visualize them in front of you, perhaps from your childhood. 
younger versions of you that you've been resisting, that you've been disconnected from, that you've been hating. And seeing those younger versions in front of you now, could you allow yourself to forgive them, to embrace them, to welcome them back, to hug them, to shower them with unconditional love and acceptance. And just welcome in all sensations. Can you forgive those younger versions of you right here, right now? Tune into the sensations and inhale for six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold for three. Exhale for six. Shh. Two, three, four, five, six. Hold for three again. And breathe normally. And seeing yourself as you are right here in this moment. Seeing yourself in front of you, sitting here listening to my voice in this room. Can you embrace this current version of you right now with unconditional love and acceptance, just as you embrace those younger versions of you? Can you let every part of you know in this moment, I love you, I embrace you, I accept you, I am here for you? Is there any resistance? Can you forgive everything about this current version of you? And let's get ready for the biggest breath yet. Any and all sensations, tune into them and inhale now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold for three. Let it go. Shh. Two, three, four, five. Six, hold for three again, and breathe normally. And just take a moment to let things settle. Bring some awareness into your feet, feeling the floor beneath you. Up your legs, feeling the chair beneath you. Into your stomach, your chest your shoulders, out your arms, into your hands and fingertips, back up into your neck, your face, the top of your head, your entire body. And having let go of some of that resistance, let go of some of that self-attack, having embraced those younger versions of you, embraced this current version of you, we're slowly going to get ready to come back to the present moment on the count of five. One, feel the floor beneath your feet. Two, the chair beneath you. Three, your entire body, every part of it. Four, with your eyes closed still, shift your awareness to the environment around you, sitting here listening to my voice. Getting ready to come back to the present moment, the right here, right now, ready to have an amazing rest of your night, rest of your week, rest of your year, rest of your life. <sighs> Connected a bit more to the authentic self, ready to crush this thing called life and open your eyes on the count of five. Like this program is such a game changer. The way everything's structured and the material, it's been already even for me, it's just been, I'm noticing a crazy change in, in the way that my whole life's like playing out. What you put together is just incredible. There's nothing like that. I've just jumped like a million levels. It's just been a complete 180 for my experience of existing. That's awesome. <laughs> it's just been so huge in terms of so many of the things I'm finally understanding and realizing and epiphanies I'm having. What you do is a huge inspiration to me and I think it's 
one of the most beautiful things you can give to another human in this entire world. You saved my in life, man. I'm telling you, that's this is real, man. Sometimes all it takes is just one person who believes in you. Find people who are where you are in life and model them, work with them. I would not be here if I didn't have people who held me accountable. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt a click and things are changing. This program was just top notch. Seriously, like this is a masterpiece. This is, this is perfect. Everything, the way it's set up, the live calls, like all the support from the coaches, it's incredible. It's, it's been nuts. I just had my tears of joy. This was the best decisions I ever made. Thank you for creating something wonderful like this. This program was phenomenal. This program was, uh, was amazing. This program has definitely changed my life. I know for a fact I'm in the right place. This is exactly what I was expecting from the program. It's been uh, spectacular. I feel really lucky to, to have found you. Thank you so much, Julian. It's, uh, it's worth every dollar.